it says we are live we'll wait for a, mo a minute to start i'll just share the links with our audience Good evening, everyone. Welcome to Caravan. This is Ishan Sharma. If you're new to the channel, I would really request you to subscribe uh, the channel. With me today, uh, I'm joined by a very special guest, somebody who has been an inspiration to a whole generation of uh, political science students, history students, and foreign policy thinkers, Ambassador Retired Shiv Shankar Menon. And uh, this is the second time he's on Caravan, so we are really fortunate to host him again. Uh, Shiv Shankar Menon is one of the most distinguished diplomats and one of the most respected foreign policy thinkers in the world. He is a former so foreign uh, secretary of India and was national security advisor to the prime minister of India, Manmohan Singh. And he's the author of Choices in the, Inside the Making of Indian Foreign Policy, which came out in 2016, and more recently, India and in Asian geopolitics, the past, present. This uh, lecture is based on his recent release, India and Asian geopolitics, where um, he's going to speak and trace India's approach to the shifting regional landscape since its independence in 1947. Um, those who have joined us, if you have any question for Ambassador Menon, you can share the question in the live YouTube chat. We'll be taking those questions towards the end of this lecture. So without further ado, I welcome uh, Ambassador Menon and uh, I hand over this mic to you. Uh, so thank you so much, sir, for accepting our invitation. Thank you, Ishan. Thank you for having me again and actually for that very flattering and undeserved introduction. But good of you to have me. Uh, I, I'll be speaking about India and Asian geopolitics. Uh, about which I've just published a book in April called India and Asian Geopolitics, The Past, Present, because uh, I do believe that how we've dealt with Asian geopolitics in the past also affects the way we deal with it at present. Uh, why did I write the book? Uh, because frankly, I realized that much of what my generation takes for granted, you know, I, I was born in the first, first half of the last century, just barely, I mean, the last year, of first half. But when I was teaching in university, I discovered that my students were all born in this century. And so what I took for granted, when I said Mrs. In, Mrs. Gandhi, meaning Indira Gandhi, they thought I meant Sonia Gandhi. For them, my life was history already. So I thought it's worth it putting down how it looked and what it was like to for India to practice foreign policy through this period. And I thought it worth looking at Asia because that is, in a sense, uh, there's not very much writing or looking at that, even though that's our neighborhood, that's our home. And that's critical, actually, to the way we deal with the world. What happens in the subcontinent, in the Indi Indian Ocean region, and further afield, Southeast Asia, West Asia, uh, Northeast Asia. Uh, and because if you look at it right from the beginning, the first thing the government, interim government did when it came to power was even before formal independence on the 15th of August, 1947. In March itself, they organized a conference, a nation relations conference at Purana Kila in Delhi, uh, invited people from uh, representatives from countries of Asia, but since most of them, many of them were colonies and so on, from freedom movements and other representative national leaders throughout Asia. Uh, now, which gives you a sense of how important they understood Asia to be. Uh, and, uh, but I think over time, somehow concentration, certainly in academia, other places, the public mind also has been on certain major relationships with uh, the US, with China, with Pakistan, rather than situating us in our context in Asia and how we've dealt with it. Because I think that's been a very important, uh, actually, 
uh, thread running right through our policy. Uh, so it's a neglected story in a sense. Uh, but if you look at, look at the world today, it's critical. Asia today is again at the center of global politics. It's at the center of the global economy, uh, as we'll see in the course of this lecture. So for me, Asian geopolitics and reminding ourselves of how we came here and also of where we are. So the book is in these two parts, the past, which sort of describes the how since independence we've coped and uh, and dealt with Asian geopolitics and then the present which is a description of the situation as as I see it and what I think we should be doing since it's very hard for a diplomat to resist the temptation to preach uh, so the portion of the book about the past basically is uh, deals with three periods uh, India gained independence, and soon thereafter, the Cold War solidified. By 1954, uh, Pakistan had a defense agreement with the U.S., was joining the U.S. Cold War Pacts, Seattle Cento, and uh, already the Cold War was hot in Asia. In fact, people keep calling it the Cold War, but the killing fields of that Cold War and the deaths, which battlefield deaths were on average right through, over 200,000 every year were in Asia. You think of where they were. They were in Korea, the Korean War, one of the bloodiest and really most uh, painful wars. Vietnam, continuous, a series of wars. You look at what was happening in West Asia uh, from 48 onwards, uh, and in South Asia as well, four wars in the first 23 years of the Republic. Uh, so in some ways, the Cold War was not cold in Asia. This was where the killing fields were. Uh, but independent India could not behave the way British India had or the Raj had for three simple reasons. Because partition, by creating Pakistan, the subcontinent was divided against itself. India was cut off physically from Central Asia and West Asia. And its only access to West Asia now was by sea. But that was the second big change. The Raj could rely on the Royal Navy before 1942, before World War II, uh, for maritime security and for control of the naval of the sea routes through the Indian Ocean. Uh, but the Royal Navy had been withdrawn, and, and the inheritance of the of the Raj government was really sea blind because the Raj government had been concerned with land borders, with the great game with Russia, with Afghanistan and so on. Not so much with, uh, not about sea power, which was an imperial subject before. So that was the second part of our inheritance, a degree of sleep blindness, which had to be cured. But the third big change was that China came into Tibet in 1950, China took over Tibet. The, for the first time in history, we had Chinese troops on our borders. For the first time in history, we actually had a border with China, not just with Tibet, with whom we had actually lived in peace through history and with whom we actually had a sense of the border. We had a traditional customary boundary, which we respected and both sides knew how to deal with it. Uh, so, so India was, the Republic of India was actually born in a very different geopolitical situation than the regime from which, to which it was a successor. And it also came to, with very strong drivers. For one thing, uh, drivers of policy and considerations which actually, in a sense, set Indian foreign policy on a certain path which we have continued for most of, of the period ever since. You know, 200 years of colonialism had re reduced one of the world's most advanced, richest societies into one of the poorest and most backward. I mean, at independence, if you look at India's condition, only 14% of the population was literate, among women less than 8%. Life expectancy was somewhere around 26, 27 years. For 50 years before independence, India had not grown 
the economy. It was 0.005% growth. That's it. While the population had kept growing. So in effect, people were getting poor. People were poor. Disease was rampant. Couldn't feed ourselves. I mean, you know, the Bengal famine before, just before that was created by the actions of the colonial government. Uh, so India had been reduced to a really abject condition. And our capabilities for foreign policy were very limited. Uh, but in that condition, everyone agreed, no matter what their political differences internally, everyone agreed that our main task was to transform India into a modern, uh, prosperous country where every Indian can realize their full potential or has the opportunity to realize their full potential. Uh, and that is the primary goal of Indian foreign policy. It has been, it is today, and for the foreseeable future, it will remain. To use whatever we can externally to transform India, to make India into a prosperous, secure, modern country, uh, and to create, to the extent we can, as our capabilities grow, an external environment which could promote the transformation of India, uh, which means that the task was not to you know, undo partition, get revenge for some historical wrongs, expand the territory, none of this. Nor was it seeking some status, some mythical status, we're going to be a great power, we're going to be a superpower, we're going to control this, manage that, be hegemon. No, it was to transform the lives of our people. And foreign policy was meant to, and this Frankly, it doesn't matter which party was in power, but this has been our goal right through, to have a foreign policy which enables that transformation of India. The rest will come with that transformation, you know, whether it is the accumulation of power, whether it is status, whether it is uh, recognition, all that. Uh, but that is secondary and it comes later. And we went through basically three periods of uh, the situation around us. One was a global, global Cold War, which polarized Asia. Asia was divided between the two blocks. The Americans actually built alliance structures in Asia, which the Russians, the Soviets never managed to do, uh, because partly of their uh, dispute with uh, China after 1956. But, uh, and in that situation, India chose and made the bright, really the brave choice to stay non-aligned, to stay out of the two blocks and to do whatever they could within, in the space between the blocks. And frankly, it, it was a good choice. It, uh, it was a brave choice because it wasn't the easy choice at all. Uh, but in the long run, I think it, it worked. It, uh, but with, but the, with the end of the Cold War and the collapse of the Soviet Union in 1990, uh, the world changed again. Uh, the, we were then in a unipolar world where there was only one global superpower, the US. And, uh, the, and so we also changed into a multi-directional pol uh, foreign policy. We had seen the change coming through the 80s and you could see the shift. We started, we made attempts to improve our relationship with Pakistan. We opened up relations with China and arrived at an understanding with China on how to manage our differences, which lasted for almost 30 years and worked, uh, doesn't work anymore now, uh, not since 2020. Uh, but, and, transformed our relationship with the US during this period steadily, uh, opened up the economy to the rest of the world, and uh, basically, uh, well, uh, established an embassy in Israel, for instance, started as an office in Taiwan, uh, basically multiplied our options. I mean, once the Cold War rigidities were gone, we then went out and used the opportunity and started concentrating on economic diplomacy and so on.
But that unipolar moment in the world didn't last very long. By 2008, there was a global financial crisis. Uh, it looked as though the Western economies were going into a deep recession. Of course, the US managed to pull herself out of it and to avoid the worst consequences, but Europe suffered. Uh, and since then, a whole series of events, including the US turning inwards, those who used to run the old economic order, post-war orders, no longer being willing to do so, meant that we have been in a situation that I describe as being between orders. This is not a new bipolar world or a multipolar world, all these fashionable phrases that people use, but we are really between orders. And the proof of that for me is the, the abysmal way in which the world responded to COVID. There was no coherent international response. And all these, all these alphabet soup of anagrams, you know, UNSC, G20, you name it, G7, uh, all of them met WHO, they all met, had meetings, did this, that, and the other, but nothing happened. None of them came up. There was no coherent response. And in contrast to the response to the global financial crisis in 2008 was the activation of the G20, which in November 2008, April in London 2009, actually came up with a coherent set of responses, which prevented the world going into the kind of uh, depression that it did in, 19, in the 1930s. Uh, so for me, today, the world is between uh, orders. But what does that mean? And most of my book is actually about the present today. What kind of situation are we in today? Uh, because in the meantime, globalization in the years, especially from the 80s onwards, from the early 80s onwards, globalization and uh, the rapid emergence of not just China, but India, of Korea, of other countries, uh, of Vietnam. Uh, this has really changed the balance of power internationally. And it's also brought the center of gravity of global politics, of the economy, back to Asia. Back meaning in historical terms, back where it was before the rise of the West, the great divergence, the Industrial Revolution. Uh, so suddenly Asian geopolitics has become very important. And as a consequence, the importance of the subcontinent of the Indian Ocean region is, uh, has risen tremendously. Uh, you know, during the Cold War, the main fault line was between the US and the Soviet Union in Europe. Uh, these parts of the world were a sideshow or a place to fight proxy wars, etc. cetera, Asia. Uh, today, the roles are reversed. Europe is a sideshow. When something happens in the Ukraine, it bothers the Europeans, it bothers the Russians, maybe it bothers the Americans as well. But it doesn't bother the rest of the world. It doesn't affect the global economy anymore. Uh, it used to, and it did when Hungary, for instance, went into revolt in 1956, but not today. Today, it's what happens in Asia, particularly South, Southeast, Northeast Asia that really matters. And therefore, there's much greater external involvement and contention, great power contention, in our immediate neighborhood. Today, China is willing to interfere in the inter internal politics of Myanmar, of Nepal, of Sri Lanka. The US wants Nepal to be part of their free and open Indo-Pacific strategy. Uh, so there's a whole new phase of power politics unmediated by institutions. Uh, secondly, if because of Asia's phenomenal economic success, they have been able to indulge in the last two decades, a little bit more, in an unprecedented arms race. Asia is one of the most heavily armed parts of the world, and it continues. It's also 
there is, if you look at it, one of the most heavily nuclearized neighborhoods. That's what we live in. There's a belt of weapons of mass destruction all the way from the Mediterranean to the Pacific, from Israel to North Korea. And it's full of revisionist powers. Uh, the center of world contention is here. China, US is the main fault line now because as a result of globalization and other shifts, uh, China's rise has been the biggest shift in the, in the balance of power. In 1980, the advanced countries, the OECD members, accounted for 64% of global GDP. Uh, by 2016, this was down to 42%. The US share, in that 64 was roughly the same between 25 27 percent still is but the european share fell from 1980 30 percent to 16 percent it's almost halved by 2016 and the biggest gainer of course was china who went from 2.3 percent of gdp global gdp in 1980 to 17.8 percent in 2016 india went from a little less than three percent to 7.24 percent by 2016, and the results were staggering. Actually, between 20, 2000 and 2011, India and China pulled 232 million people out of poverty, with India accounting for 140 million of those. And by 2014, India and China together accounted for about half of Asia's total GDP. Uh, so. In PPP terms, frankly, they are the world's largest and third largest economies since 2015, uh, 2014, actually. Uh, so there has been a huge shift in economic power, and that economic power has been used uh, to build, actually, hard, hard military power, hard political influence, uh, and it hasn't been evenly distributed. Some countries have done much better than the others. India and China, which immediately after the Cold War were able to coexist and had put in place CBMs on the border and so on, were roughly the same size economies in 1980. They were at about the same technological level. And if anything, India was more integrated into the global economy uh, in, in 1980. By uh, 2018, the Chinese economy was almost five times India's size because China grew much faster than India, over 10% for about 30 plus years. India grew at over 7%, at over 6%, around 7% for about 30 years. And that's the glory of compounding. But the Chinese economy now is almost five times bigger than, than the Indian economy in technological terms, more advanced, also much more integrated because China joined into global value chains and supply chains, uh, which India was not integrated to the same level. Even though for both India and China, the pattern of growth and of globalization meant that they were now much more dependent on the world than ever before. So while they were getting more powerful, they were also getting more dependent on the world. Uh, at its peak, more than half of India's GDP was dependent on the external sector. I mean, just external merchandise trade in 2014 was about 49.6% of India's GDP. And you add services, you add remittances, and so on, you're well over 50% of GDP. Uh, for China, the figure was even higher at one stage. Of course, it's all come down now. Now China is in the 31% or so. India is also somewhere in that same range, is external merchandise trade as a percentage of GDP. With, what it means is that both countries have integrated their economies with the rest of the world. And it's in that process of integration with the rest of the world that they have actually managed to pull so many people out of poverty. They've managed to improve the lot of their own people uh, that India managed to, as I said, during the high growth years, grow by 7% for, for over 30 years, uh, and China at 10%. Both economies have been slowing in this last decade. 
and the secular trend is is actually downwards is to a reversion of towards historical mean in both both economies but the pattern of growth and their resource endowment means that they cannot turn their back on the world uh, I think the lesson that that I draw in the book, at least, and that many other people do, is that uh, India certainly has done best historically when it is most open to the world and most engaged and most integrated into the world economy. And for China, there isn't much of a history of this, but today certainly China needs uh, the rest of the world. And why do I say this? For India, part of it is our resource endowment. We depend on the world for our energy, for fertilizer, for non-ferrous metals, uh, which we don't have. And of course, for the access to markets, to technology, uh, including financing. I mean, why do we seek foreign investment? Same thing is true of China. At an even larger scale, China is a huge, since uh, 1994, China is an importer of energy. Uh, and she, is, she now is a major importer of a whole series of commodities and determines commodity prices and markets around the world. Uh, in order just to keep her economy going, uh, she also, it's between India and China together, we, we are the major importers of fertilizer in the world. Uh, she lacks ferrous metals, so she imports iron ore from India, from Brazil, from Australia, and so on. Uh, and technology. I mean, China has made strides in technology, but in 2019, uh, she imported six times the IP that she exported, which gives you some idea. And she has dependencies as she moves up the value chain, frankly, whether it's for robotics, motors, whether it's for semiconductors, for the electronics industry, whether it's, it's across a whole range of technologies, basic technologies and many of the fundamental building blocks, she still imports in very large quantities. So she needs the world, so does India. And as a result of this phenomenal growth, we both need the world and are much more integrated. So when we say that this is an interdependent world, it is interdependent, but don't forget the stress is on the dependency. And this for the Chinese is a brand new situation. They've been powerful and independent in the past for most of their history. They've run a self-contained economy. When they were forced to open, by the West in 1840 after the Opium Wars and so on, uh, they were weak and dependent and interdependent, if you like. Uh, today, as a result of this phenomenal growth, they are powerful, but they are also dependent. And this is something they're not used to. Uh, in India, I think we are used to being interdependent, to being connected, to being engaged with the world. All the periods when we've done best and the bits of India that have done best historically are really maritime India, the parts that are connected to the rest of the world, whether it's Gujarat, whether it's Malabar coast, Karmandal coast, Wanga in the larger sense, the whole Orissa, Bengal, at coast. It's maritime India, which has been the most prosperous, the most advanced, the most industrialized in history, which was most connected to Southeast Asia, to West Asia and others. So, the one big message of my book is really that uh, India does best, the more connected she is. And the book is really a very strong plea for engagement. Uh, but living in a globalized world with all its unintended consequences is not very easy. Uh, because it's not only a shift in the balance of economic power, and therefore a much easier world. Because with the pushback against globalization, uh, in some of the homes of the traditional order in, in Europe, in Britain, in, in the US, and so on, you are also seeing a reaction to the rise of China, especially. And the US has, since World War II, concentrated on preventing the emergence of a peer competitor. First, it was the Soviet Union, which they saw off. During the 80s, they thought it might be Japan, 
who was acquiring acquire, who had acquired economic power very rapidly, but that soon fizzled out. But now it's China. And so you see strategic contention between the US and China and pushback across the board, not just political and military contention, but also economically. Uh, some of the decoupling in technology, uh, some of the actions against Huawei, for instance, all these are in order to prevent actually the rise of China. And the Chinese can see this. The Chinese are reacting accordingly. They see the US as standing in the way of their rise. Uh, you see the same phenomenon on another scale between India and China. As the balance has shifted against India, India now sees China standing in the way of India's rights. China opposes India's membership in the NSG, opposes India's membership in the UN Security Council. When So at, at every stage, you enjoy, opposes India's membership in APEC, for instance. It's very happy to see you walk out of RCEP, out of the new free trade area that's been formed in the Asia-Pacific region. Uh, so today we are actually living in a world of great power rivalry of and the main one is really china us contention but as china sees this happening china also sees that her window of opportunity the moment of her relative strength and power may be limited because she has a demography thanks to the one child policy where she is aging very rapidly she will be losing not just labor force but she will have huge costs pensions, supporting the aged, et cetera. Uh, and therefore, she has become much more assertive in her periphery in trying to become a maritime power to control the sea routes which carry this trade, which has made her growth possible, uh, in trying to reunify Taiwan, where she's much more assertive in asserting her territorial claims on the Senkaku Islands or the Aoyu Islands in the East China Sea against Japan on the India-China border, where you saw in 2020, she tried to change the status quo militarily across the line in several places. And a problem that still hasn't been solved, but we are still in the process of negotiating and working on. Uh, so, and there's been pushback against globalization. The, in effect, there is economic and political fra fragmentation. Globalization made the world into one big economy, integrated. But now, if you look at it, there's a North, North, North American free trade area, USMCA, they call it now. Uh, there's the EU as another trading block. And in Asia, there's two competing visions. There's the, the TPP, Trans-Pacific Partnership, which set much higher standards for integration and for, for the economies uh, to open to each other. And the RCEP, the Regional Cooperative Economic Partnership, which includes China, Japan, Korea, all 10 ASEAN members and Australia and New Zealand, it was negotiated for eight years. We were part of the negotiation. We left at the last minute in December, 2019. Uh, we chose not to get involved. Uh, so, and all the flashpoints and hotspots in Asia are now live. You know about our border with China since 2020 spring. But if you look at Senkaku, you look at South China Sea, you look at Taiwan, you look at all these areas. In each of these cases, uh, these, they, these have become hot. And China's maritime neighbors, are cooperating increasingly in defense, in security, in intelligence, uh, because they're concerned by, the, by Chinese behavior, by China's assertion, and by the rise of this hyper-nationalist rising power. Uh, so where does this leave us in Asian geopolitics? Uh, I think it leaves us as India with a much more confused situation, with a much more difficult situation. For one thing, you cannot rely on uh, the international institutions to deal with crises or with security threats uh, or with anything that might happen. I mean, you've, you've, as I mentioned to you, traditional multilateralism really failed in response to COVID, uh, nor did, has it come up with a coherent 
economic response to the consequences of the pandemic, uh, all these organizations have been missing in action. And this is very different from the international response previously to similar crises. Uh, secondly, we have to navigate a world where, while you can't rely on some international order or multilateral organizations to deal with it, we have to navigate a world where there has been a rise in new authoritarian politics across the board, which, uh, whether it is Xi Jinping, whether it was Abe in Japan, whether it's in India, where, whether it is, you know, Putin, you can keep going, Erdogan, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, frankly, this sort of authoritarian politics, which claims its legitimacy from nationalism, from, uh, it actually makes diplomacy give and take much more difficult because uh, every foreign policy issue becomes a sovereignty issue, becomes a win or lose issue, uh, and foreign policy gets intertwined with domestic policy. And that actually makes life much harder, which is why there is no sign of any of these disputes or any of these issues, whether it's North Korea nuclear weapons program, whether it's Taiwan Straits, whether it's South China Sea, there's no sign of any of these heading towards a resolution. If anything, they're just going on and on, and they're not frozen conf conflicts. They're evolving situations where the balance of power keeps shifting. Uh, so what should we do? I think it's clear that since we can't rely on others, since there are limits to external balancing also, even asking others who might share your concerns. I mean, we formed the Quad, for instance, because of concern about maritime security in this open oceanic space, all the way from the west coast of Africa to the so east coast of Africa to the west coast of Americas. Uh, but we might share those concerns. But when push comes to shove, when the Chinese actually move on your LAC, you have to deal with it yourself. So the first thing you have to do is self-strengthening. In this kind of anarchic situation, international situation, there is no way past that. We need to gather the elements of hard power, which are primarily military and economic. And we need to make sure that we can convert that to political outcomes, whether it is creating deterrence on the India-China border, whether it's you know, dealing, being a provider of security in the neighborhood so that the neighborhood is uh, integrated into your calculations and you are integrated into theirs, whether it is integrating the subcontinent economically with those who, who are willing to do so, so that we can achieve common prosperity, because you can't do this on your own. Uh, I, there's no question that we need to start with self-strengthening and with our own immediate neighborhood. We need to integrate the subcontinent and the Indian Ocean. India to be an economic hub, net provider of security, and to be seen as a source of stability by the neighbors. I think that's important. We must expect them to do some external balancing. Obviously, when they see your relations with China deteriorating, they will then play both sides. They'll get what they can from both sides. They will tell you that they're getting something from the Chinese. They'll tell the Chinese they're getting something from you and why don't you match it and so on. But frankly, that's a game that we can play and we need to play to our strengths. Uh, we should be the main source of prosperity, security and so on and stability in, in our immediate neighborhood, meaning the subcontinent and the Indian Ocean region. We should work with external partners. I'm not saying don't externally balance, but don't count on that to solve your problems unless you can also do your self-strengthening. The US is an essential partner. Uh, and not only because you and the US may have similar views of what China is doing. You, the US is critical for the transformation of India as a source of technology. Uh, look at the Green Revolution. We feed ourselves today because of the Green Revolution. Who did we do that with? We did it with US science. Uh, and we see increasing convergence in the way we, we look at issues in Asia, whether it's maritime security, the safety of these sea lanes, which carry our trade, our energy. Uh, we both have a similar approach and that's how the Quad actually started. Uh, 
And so the US is in many ways an indispensable partner. But you must remember that like, like any superpower, uh, there are limits to how far she would like to see another power rise. Secondly, she operates on her interests, which uh, when they conflict with their values will trump their values. And so what we have today with the US is a partnership with many of the features of an alliance. For instance, some of the recent defense agreements that have been signed by, by this government of India with the US uh, amount to a form of interoperability. But we have no commitment to the defense of the other. So we're not in a military alliance. But we have some of the features of that in terms of working very closely together on issues where we have a congruence of interest. Uh, so for me, therefore, it's important that we recognize that we and that we recognize the shifts that have taken place, particularly nation geopolitics, the things that I've mentioned and that we concentrate on our neighborhood and Asia. And we use external balancing to buttress our self-strengthening and what we are doing in the region itself. One thing that we need, which we so far have not shown, is developing an external economic policy which works alongside our foreign defense uh, and strategic outreach. Uh, we cannot walk away from economic integration. We cannot take Atmanir Bharta to the point of import substitution. We can't walk away from RCP when there's the world's greatest free trade area is being formed in our neighborhood in Asia. Uh, and then expect to be active participants in the political life, the defense, the security, other issues of Southeast Asia, East, Northeast Asia, and even of parts of South, South Asia, which will inevitably be attracted towards uh, a much more prosperous and secure Southeast Asia. Uh, walking out of RCP actually says that we think we will not be competitive for the next 20 years, which is the adjustment period provided. And it guarantees that we will not be competitive, but it conveys absolutely the wrong strategic signal. And frankly, it also makes it hard for you to follow the kinds of policies, integrationist, open, engaged, political, military outreach that we should be following in this situation. Uh, but, and for, to my mind, we have no choice but to engage with India meaningfully, because all that we need is to be found in Asia. And our security, our prosperity will be determined in Asia. So we need an economic leg. How do we deal with the various issues and the various contradictions between these, these countries in Asia and the other great powers? My answer is issue-based coalitions, the willing. Depending on the issue, find a coalition of partners who are capable of doing something, who share your concerns. Uh, if it's maritime security, it'd be one set of partners. If it's cybersecurity, it's another set of partners. Whether it's economic cooperation, it'll be another set of partners. And you need to do that. Uh, and we need to do what all successful rising powers have done in history, which is to gather material power steadily, to build a narrative of success, and to keep our head down, to follow, in other words, an accommodationist strategy, not to be over ambitious, trying to change things, appearing to be much bigger than we are. Play by the existing rules until you have sufficient power to change them. I mean, that's, and there is a fine judgment required. Uh, most countries actually have got it wrong in the past, whether it was, you know, Wilhelm in Germany, World War I, or Nazi Germany, World War II, whether it was militarized Japan in the 30s. Uh, most of them have actually got it wrong, have made their move too soon. China may have done the same. We don't know. Uh, but I think if, if I had to summarize what I'm trying to say, I'd say talk less and do more. Uh, I'll stop here. I don't want to go on and on. I'd much rather hear what you think is our situation and what you think we should be doing. 
uh, floor is open. Ishan. Thank you so much, Ambassador Menon, for, for such an interesting and uh, exciting lecture. Uh, my, my initial uh, question for you is, you mentioned about our, our CEP and India walking away from that and also many BITs, you know, in uh, not following the BITs regulations in the UK. And there were some questions around that also. But in the, in the starting years, in the early years of our republic in around 50s when Nehru was leading the foreign policy and the nation, India was quite, quite outspoken in the sense of uh, marking their you know, global influence. How do you think and when do you think it started to change? And uh, is this inward looking policy uh, good for India's future? I think the record shows that an inward looking policy doesn't help us to transform India rapidly. I mean, which are the years when East Asia went so far ahead of us, grew much faster than us? Which are the worst years in economic terms, in terms of improving the lives of our people? It was the 60s and the 70s, years of self sufficiency, of import substitution of we'll do everything ourselves at home uh, because it ignored our resource endowment. It ignored the needs that we had in order to transform the economy. And it ignored the history that we did best when we were most connected, when we were most involved. That doesn't mean that you shouldn't be outspoken, not at all. In fact, the more involved you are, the more outspoken you can be because you then have an ability your words will be listened to, and you will play a role. India was very involved in Asian geopolitics in the 50s, in Nehru's time. If you look at it, we led the move on decolonization, because when India became independent, most of Asia was still under colonial masters, I and mean, the exceptions were Siam. And, you know, so it, we and we worked actively to help freedom movements across the region, not just freedom movements. We also helped to put Kim Tribhuvan back in power in Nepal, for instance. So it's not that because you're involved, because you have economic interests, because you're involved with the rest of the world, that you will suddenly keep your mouth shut and hide. No, not at all. In fact, it gives you the ability to participate in shaping the environment around you. And I think the record shows that the more influence you had, the more you actually actively participated in international processes, the more integrated you were economically, the better off you were, the better you did. The moment you opened your economy after 1990, the moment you started getting involved in these international debates, you improved your position. Those were the high growth years for your own economy. You did well. Now you can argue about, we should have distributed the gains better, we should have done various things at home. That's a domestic political argument. And frankly, on that, it's, I'm not arguing that we agree on everything. Not everybody agrees on the kind of India we want to build, that we want to transform India into. But if you say, do you want a poor India? Do you want a backward India? Do you want an insecure India? Nobody's going to say yes. So you know, at that level, I think we have sufficient consensus and a good enough sense of what kind of policy to follow. Which is why, if you look at Indian policy since 1947, there is a basic continuity to it. Even if in, in democracies, you know, governments always say all their predecessors were idiots and they are the only ones who know what they're doing. And this is normal. That they might say, and they might say nobody did anything right. We're the only ones to do it. All that each government will say. That's all right. But actually, in actual fact, there's been tremendous continuity of policy right through. And that's because of our condition and because they were realists, they understood what they saw, what India needed, and did it. Uh, do you think it is an um, after effect of increased globalization in the region that, you know, many, many countries are started looking inwards and this uh, insecurity has, you yeah, know. Globalization is interesting. It, it brought tremendous economic opportunity to some countries who were in a position to take advantage of it. Some were even more, some less, but, uh, but the other thing it did was because it 
exposed you to the way the rest of the world lived, worked, and so on. And it brought the world to you, thanks to ICT, into the palm of your hand. I mean, you could actually see it became a threat to identity. It, and the reversion, because also thanks to globalization, there were huge social changes, urbanization. Today, more than half the world's population is urban. Thanks to globalization, uh, uh, China is, is, is an urban society today. India will be in another 10, 15 years at the rate we're going. But basically, globalization moved huge numbers of people from the safety of their village, their clan, their family, from assured ways of life thinking, which they had followed for centuries, suddenly into whole new industrialized urban environments and sort of cut them loose and then expose them to all these other ideas. So a lot of what you're seeing is a reaction, is this feeling that my identity is threatened. So I go back to older, it's an imagined past, but you know, you create this imagined past, you create an identity, you start rejecting the other, you know, you because you start drawing lines. And this is politically always useful. It doesn't matter who it is, whether it is Trump saying immigrants are dangerous. You see the same phenomenon in all these countries. Uh, and that actually has created a whole new politics, a politics of emotion, uh, and the politics of mass hysteria almost of mass, and this is what the mass media, what social media, what ICT enables. Uh, and that's the politics which has led to the rise of the new authoritarians, many of whom rely on a personality cult, centralized power tremendously, but their ability to deliver is actually much lower than it was before. All these countries have slowed down and face much more complicated. And because the benefits of globalization were not distributed, you see inequality, you see resentment, you see political polarization and between the haves and the have nots. And you see this across the board. And in each of these societies, whether it's China, whether it's the US, whether it's India, we are renegotiating the social contract internally. So that's an unintended consequence of globalization, it seems to me. I don't think globalizations or you know, those who spoke of a free internet and what it would do to liberate people, I don't think they ever expected this consequence, but it is a consequence that we have to live with. And that's the kind of Asia or world that we're in today. And you talked about authoritarianism and um, in India, we are witnessing a rise of hyper-nationalism uh, how do you think this affects our foreign policy or our outlook towards the world and, uh, you know, our relations with our neighbors, immediate neighbors? You know, uh, let me put this in sort of context. As government's capacity or political parties, leaders' capacity to deliver declines, they can no longer rely on performance legitimacy, right? I mean, then... I mean, there's three forms of legitimacy. One is charisma. So uh, personality cults, for instance. The other is performance legitimacy. If you can deliver, if you can tell people your life is better today than it was yesterday, and you know it's going to be better tomorrow, your children will do better than you, then you have performance legitimacy. And the last, of course, is some form of ideological legitimation you know, either nationalism or religion or one of these, you know, a faith, a belief system, let's say. So as the capacity to deliver goes down, as performance legitimacy declines, all these new authoritarians turn towards personality cults and they turn towards, well, the, the belief systems that they have created whether you call it Hindutva or whether it's as Xi Jinping now says, Xi Jinping thought in a new era with Chinese characteristics, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, socialism with Chinese characteristics. So he, and each one will come with the same appeal to nationalism to, now that's all very well. If it's, it can be channeled, if it's patriotism, frankly, it can be channeled positively. It can lead to good outcomes. I mean, there's, but uh, what it has led to is each one turning inwards, 
You hear all of them demanding self-reliance. You see America is building back better, which means building America better or make America great again, again. I mean, Xi Jinping's program also, China Dream, amounts to make China great again. Uh, each one, Atmanir Bharta, you know, look inwards. And secondly, it makes it harder to settle diplomatic issues. You know, when Sundarum Chu happened, the Chinese came in and sat on our territory near Tawang in uh, 1986 spring. Uh, we had a multi pronged response. Arunachal was made a state. We had a military response on the ground. Within, we had a, a dialogue with the Chinese at the political level. And by 1988, Rajiv Gandhi, December, visited China, and we had a new framework for the dealing with the relationship, handling the relationship. We didn't settle everything, but we knew how to handle difficulties. But you look at what's happened since 2020. Uh, since the Chinese marched in across, tried to march in across the LAC in several points and so on, uh, you've had military level, working level talks, you've had diplomats levels talks, uh, but you haven't had the kind of response which can lead you to change the relationship or create a new strategic framework. In fact, today, the problem with China is you don't have a framework within which you're operating. And therefore, you have to prepare for the worst. You have 100,000 troops from both sides along the LAC who spent one miserable winter last year and looks like they'll have to spend this winter there also. So it isn't as though the shock and the, the change by changing the situation that we are therefore then to using that opportunity to move forward, to build a new strategic framework, some kind of understanding, how do we manage the differences or how do we even settle them? I mean, there's, there's no sign of that yet. And that is, is part of the problem because I think frankly, uh, today, the Chinese described the boundary as a sovereignty issue. Sovereignty is something you can't trade, right? Before this, the Chinese used to call it a dispute. A dispute is something you can, you will settle by give and take. Yes, I'll get something, you'll get something, we'll trade, we'll do whatever, negotiate, bargain. But a dispute can be settled. Sovereignty cannot be. So now, in this nationalist or as you said, a hyper-nationalist atmosphere, it becomes much harder to deal with issues, with crises, with situations like this. And then therefore, as this piles up, it becomes much harder to predict also where it will go and the risks, of un the risks as a result of this uncertainty piling up also go up considerably. And you have to prepare for the worst, which is not a happy state to be in you know, of uncertainty, very high risk. I mean, that's, you, in fact, you want to go the exact opposite way. You want to increase options, lower risk and uncertainty. Yeah, uh, I'll ask you one more question from my side and then I'll ask the audience question. We have many, many questions for you in the audience. Uh, <laughs> my question is recently, just two months back, uh, the Americans, uh, you know, uh, left Afghanistan and you know, it has changed the uh, whole situation of Asian geopolitics. How do you see the role of Afghanistan now and role of Indian foreign policy towards Afghanistan? I'm not sure that changed Asian geopolitics fundamentally, because the U.S., once she announced a free and open Indo-Pacific strategy, I think it was quite clear that the U.S. was no longer interested in being involved on the Eurasian man mainland. Because the free and open Indo-Pacific is a maritime strategy. And the Chinese certainly see it as a strategy to contain China in the maritime spaces from the Indian Ocean through the seas near China, South China Sea, East China Sea to the Western Pacific. Pacific. Uh, so I think it's been clear for a long time. And the US is a maritime power and has used maritime power actually as a and her stomach for land wars, she announced her withdrawal from Afghanistan in 2011. President Obama announced it. And he said, we'll be out by, by 2014. We'll surge and then we'll go. We'll settle things and leave. 
So this is no surprise. It's no, everyone says, oh, precipitate withdrawal. We've known they're going for years. I mean, I, I'm not quite sure why everyone says, oh, suddenly everything has changed. What's changed? US withdrew from Iraq, US military withdrew from Iraq a long time ago. So, you know, it's not a fundamental geopolitical shift. The problem is, I think everybody around Afghanistan got used to getting the US, relying on the US to do their work for them. Whether it's the Chinese, you know, fear of Afghanistan being used by Xinjiang separatist movements, ATM and the others, uh, whether it's uh, Iran with her problems with Baloch, Sistan, uh, whether it's Russia's concern about her soft Central Asian underbelly and the republics. Uh, but, you know, I'm not sure that we need to worry to the point where let them now start worrying about their own interests. Uh, the Pakistanis think they have a great victory. Good luck to them. I mean, I, for me, you know, the risk is of Pakistan being Talibanized, not of Afghanistan being Pakistanized. Have you ever worried about that? The Afghans have shown that they are nationalists. Whatever their ideology may be, whether it's from Taliban all the way through to the old Khalq Parcham, the communists, they were nationalists. They fought foreign influence and they have fought everybody outside who tried to control them right through. Not one of those regimes, whether it was Dawood, who was the friendliest to Pakistan, or the Taliban under the first Emirate, ever agreed on the Durand line as the border, as the boundary with Pakistan, even though Pakistan pressed very hard. And they had no other outside friends at that time. So I would be very careful before jumping to some conclusions about who has won, who has lost. I think, yes, it's a complicated situation. For, and I think the main sufferers here are the Afghan people. I think, yes, we and others need to worry about export of extremism, support for terrorism, you know, bases, training, etc. Because I don't see the Taliban cutting their links with their traditional friends. Uh, even if the leadership might want to, I'm not sure whether their rank and file, the foot soldiers, will do many of the assurances that they held out when they came into Kabul. They haven't been implemented in practice. And there is still resistance in Afghanistan. And so let's see how it develops. I, for me, this is, A, it's not a surprise. It's not some big shift in geopolitics here. Balance of power is still the same, roughly as what it was before. Yes, the Americans have withdrawn and they will go through their own you know, contortions about who's responsible, who lost Afghanistan, why this, that. that's their war, they will worry about it. But has it changed our objective situation? On the margins, yes. Maybe a little uptick in terrorism. But you know, Afghan terrorism uh, has not been a worry in India for many years. When was the last time you heard of an Afghan terrorist in India? A long time ago. So I think we need to also calm down and watch the situation and work the situation, work with our friends, work with, we have friends, and we have many people who share our interests, our concerns, and work with our Afghan friends also. I think we can do that. Uh, but I, this is, I, I really think we, it's, you know, it's, it makes for good TV. It makes for some very, you know, dramatic copy. But I think it is a little overblown. Thank you so much, Ambassador Menon. We'll now take some audience questions. The first question is by Swajan Kumar Datta. His question is, would you say that India's economic movement after 2014 was premediated and planned by the Indian institutions? Or would you say that the BJP-run government did most of the work after 2014? Uh, I don't know. Uh, that I, you know, I, I, you know, I left government in 2014, May 26th, actually. Uh, so I really don't know whether they came with a plan or they, you know, they winged it as they went along or whether they developed the plan afterwards and applied it. I, I really wouldn't know. Uh, I, 
But for me, the interesting part, at least in the initial period and in the first term of this uh, of the Modi government, was that on many of the issues where they had taken a certain stance in the opposition, once they came to power, I think they saw the logic of what India was doing, whether it was the civil nuclear agreement with the US, you know, whether it was the boundary agreement with Bangladesh, which uh, the land boundary agreement, on many of these things, they actually took it forward because they saw the logic. And this is why I say there is a certain logic and a certain continuity to Indian foreign policy, irrespective of who's in power. But on their economic policy, especially domestic economic policy, I really don't know. Uh, the, but I, you know, they engaged very actively, actually, economically also, whether it was with China, I mean, you saw something like 25, 26 billion dollars worth of Chinese investment in Indian startups and so on from 2014 to 2019, uh, 2020, actually. Uh, you saw the engagement in negotiating the RCP. They were very involved in that. I think the real shift towards uh, an inward looking policy has been maybe a product of our own slowing economy after 2016, but also of a worsening international situation. And then COVID, the pandemic, and what it did to the economy. I mean, I think that maybe contributed to this inward looking shift saying, you know, it's not safe to get into this high risk external environment. Let's look back. But I'm speculating here. I just don't know enough about when they made their plans and how they made them. Uh, the next question is a Sagnik Sarkar. His question is with rapidly uh, increasing threat perception on Taiwan. Do you think an Indo Pacific NATO that is Quad plus Taiwan, South Korea is on the cards in the next decade? Uh, no, I don't think so. I don't think the Quad is going to be converted into a military alliance. It started as a security dialogue, and I think what it has done instead is to add other global public goods, you know, whether it's vaccines or whether it's uh, building resilient supply chains, etc. It's added other aspects to its work. The security dialogue goes on, and many of these other things it's doing will actually contribute to security, either directly or indirectly, whether it is resilient supply chains, etc. Uh, but I don't see Quad actually evolving into a NATO or a military alliance. As for Taiwan, it's a complicated question. You know, if uh, the rhetoric, rhetoric has gone up and down. It varies. I mean, in his last speech, the, the Premier of China spoke again of desiring peaceful reunification. They will not rule out military reunification. But I assume that, that China is rational, that they realize that if they were to try and take it militarily, it would change the security order, the economic order in Asia and globally also, that the reactions would be very strong. Uh, how far those reactions would be military, nobody can say because there is deliberate ambiguity in the US, Japanese, other positions. Uh, you know, if, if there were an easy way of reunifying Taiwan, China would have done it already. But clearly, there are lots of reasons which prevent that, including not wanting to have the blood of his compatriots on his own hands. I think that's that's important if he wants to cement, if Xi Jinping wants to cement his place as the leader of the Chinese at the same level as Mao Zedong and Deng Xiaoping, uh, then I think, you know, he should aim for a peaceful reunification. And a lot of this pressure, talk and so on, I think is designed to do just that, to convince the Taiwanese that look, your life can be very hard, but if you accommodate us, work with one country, two systems, you know, it can be much easier and much better for you. The other thing, of course, is that now that we've all seen from the chip shortage how important Taiwan is, 63% of the world's semiconductors come out of Taiwan, out of TSMC, of one company. Uh, you know, suddenly now Taiwan acquires a certain strategic weight also. And so it's, it's become quite complicated, the whole calculus around Taiwan. I'd be, I wouldn't be misled by the rhetoric. If you look at the history since 49, since the founding of the PRC, 
rhetoric has gone up and down at various stages. Uh, but ultimately, they've behaved, both sides have behaved carefully. They, they've known each other's red lines and they've not quite crossed them yet. Even all these flights that we saw, you know, by Chinese fighter aircraft and bombers, PLA aircraft, uh, they never actually crossed the median line between Taiwan and they did cross into Ch Taiwan's air defense identification zone, which actually extends hundreds of kilometers into the mainland. But they didn't cross the median line in the strait, in the Taiwan Strait. So they didn't actually intrude where they would think it, it is an immediate direct threat that needs to be responded to. So there is a sort of dance going on here, which I think we need to, to analyze much more carefully. Uh, the next question is, what do you think about the future of the highly publicized Iran-China deal? Mm, it's, you know, it's been going on for a long time. And if you were Iran, what would you do? If you were Iran facing US pressure, sanctions, and not even a willingness by the US to say, okay, we'll come back to the old deal and we'll implement it as it was. If you, that is being renegotiated, and in other words, the terms of the negotiation are shifting on you all the time. You sign an agreement, implement it, then the other side walks away, then in order to come back to the agreement, they say, now let's renegotiate again. Then what would you do? You'd look for alternatives. You'd look for ways of actually lessening the pressure. So the economic pressure, certainly China can help. She's the world's second biggest economic power. So China does provide you with some lessening of the economic pressure, an alternative. Uh, and she also tells the US, that, look, I have options, so you'd better be much more accommodating in our negotiation. So it, it has several benefits from the Iranian point of view. But it's an interesting thing. The Chinese uh, and Iranians have been talking about this grand bargain for many years. I mean, I remember hearing about it eight years ago. Uh, and the record of implementation of China-Iran agreements, so MOUs on oil exploration, other industrial collaborations, etc., is not very inspiring, which suggests to me that both sides use it, but ultimately take their decisions on viability, on what works. But they also find it politically very useful, and this is why all these are kept alive and going all the time. But, you know, Iran is a proud, independent nation with a long tradition of statecraft. And I don't think we should ever underestimate them or expect them to become anybody else's instrument. And for me, at least, it's, you know, that's the lesson of Iranian history. And our whole experience with Iran has actually been very good especially Iran after the revolution. Uh, and I think we have a lot of common interests with Iran, which we should actually be concentrating on at this time. And there is, I'm sure that there's always more that we can do together, especially with the situation in Afghanistan being what it is, with our need for energy and for peace in the Gulf, where you know we have now almost 8 million Indians living and working. Uh, the next question is, uh, what's your opinion on the potential of Chinese debt trap uh, diplomacy in politically volatile Africa with recent setbacks due to cancellation of billion dollar contracts in Ghana, DRC and Kenya? Uh, well, let me say this, that many, you know, it depends on the country, on the project, the VRI project. Many of the projects that the Chinese seem to have included in BRI uh, are not economically viable. So yes, they are a debt trap, but they are a debt trap for both sides. After all, if someone can't pay, it's also a creditor's problem, right? I mean, what does he do? Look at Hambantota, for instance. 
which they built the port. It couldn't generate enough revenue to pay back what the Chinese had put in to it, $1.2 billion. Uh, so then the Sri Lankans offered the Chinese equity in it. Ch Chinese said, no, no, no. But they said, give us a long lease, 99 years, and add an industrial park, et cetera, which maybe that can make enough money. Uh, the, so they did that. They gave them a long lease. So now the Chinese have a long lease, but they have a long lease on a dud. It couldn't pay to start with. How is it going to pay now? Maybe the industrial park will, but that will take years to develop. In the meantime, Colombo is flourishing. It's too close to Colombo, quite frankly. Uh, so, yes, it's a debt trap. But it, you know, as somebody once said, if you owe the bank enough money, you own the bank. You know, because all the bank's money is with you. So for many of these countries who have entered into, or the leaders who have entered into these deals, repayment is a matter for the long future, maybe not even for them. Uh, but they get the project now, they get something built, they get the financing that they wouldn't otherwise get. The terms might be terrible when you compare them with other international financing, but some of these countries like DRC and so on have no access to financing. Nobody in his right mind would put his money there if he really wanted to have it back. So people will go in for strategic reasons, and that's many of the Chinese investments are for strategic reasons, are for access to raw materials, are because they want to be somewhere, etc. Uh, so, so yes. It is a debt trap, but it's not a one-way debt trap diplomacy which works in only in China's favor. Secondly, it's not very smart diplomacy for you to go around telling other people that, oh, you're going into a debt trap, because it amounts to telling them you're a fool. You don't know what you're doing. I know what you're doing. And for them, you know, I mean, it's, this is not welcome advice. And if you want to persuade them to change their behavior, calling them out publicly as being foolish is not the right way. If you really want to get them to change what they do, then go and persuade them, give them alternatives, offer them something else, see what else can be done, explain the situation, but do it quietly. You don't publicly stand up and say, oh, these guys are all idiots because they're falling into a debt trap. Uh, so I think we need to be a little careful in the choice of words we use when we talk to other people. Yes, uh, there's somebody named Carbon who is asking about India's role in Southeast Asia. Mm -hmm. Well, if you look at uh, the record, there was an extended period in the 70s, 80s, when we really had very little to do with Southeast Asia. Partly because we had our own domestic preoccupations and our preoccupations, especially in the 60s and 70s with Pakistan, with China, uh, but also because once China and the US made up and functioned in a virtual alliance after 1971, uh, they were determined to keep everybody else out of Southeast Asia. And ASEAN was quite happy to go along with integrating their economies with Japan, building the first global value chains, first regional uh, industrializing. And that was really the period when Southeast Asia did best economically in terms of very rapid growth. You saw the South little tigers, the Southeast Asian tigers, dragons, etc. And we, in a sense, got left out of that process. It's only after 1990, with the end of the Cold War, uh, that we actually re-engaged with Southeast Asia, both economically in 1992, and that's when I announced Look East, uh, starting as an economic policy, because this was a, one of the most dynamic regions of the world, economically speaking, but also with political, military, other, and it gradually expanded over time. And certainly trade has grown tremendously in the two decades, in the three decades since then. But I think, unfortunately, in the last few years, especially by walking out of RCP, 
I think it's now going into reverse. Uh, because unless we are willing to stay open to Southeast Asia and integrate in this new regional architecture that they are building, this economic architecture, we made the same mistake when APEC was formed in the late 80s, early 90s, and we chose not to be part of it. Uh, you could say that India was going through an economic crisis, had unstable coalition governments under VP Singh, etc. Uh, so it was, maybe it wasn't the best time, but also there was Southeast Asian resistance to India being part of that. Uh, they, I remember Mahathir, for instance, made it quite clear he didn't want India into what later became APEC, started as an East, East Asian caucus, as he called it. So I think our, this stop-go, hot-cold sort of policy change towards Southeast Asia has actually hurt us because uh, this is an area of tremendous economic dynamism, which is looking for alternatives to dependence on China, economic dependence on China and security dependence on the US, and is now being torn by Sino US rivalry into making difficult choices. They don't want to have to choose, they want alternatives. India can be an alternative if we position ourselves right and if we do the right things, opening ourselves economically and being a security provider, working with them on security, intelligence, other defense, et cetera. There is a lot we can do, but you can't do just the defense intelligence political part, not do the economics. So I think that's what our experience shows. Uh, there's a fairly sizable chunk about this in the book, actually, because uh, Southeast Asia for me is the great opportunity that actually exists in today's confused world. There are other opportunities as well. I mean, the US is an opportunity. You know, yes, it's a troubled world. It's much more uncertain, dangerous, et cetera. But in danger is where there is opportunity. I mean, there's opportunity in Southeast Asia. There's opportunity in the US. There's opportunity in our neighborhood where countries want some certainty, they want somebody to work with. And uh, the whole host of opportunities actually in maritime security, et cetera, you can, you can go on listing them. Many of the threats actually also open up a chance to do new things, to make new friends. Uh, we'll, we'll take three last questions for the evening. Um, we have 10 more minutes to conclude the session. Um, before that, we'll be putting the links to both uh, Ambassador Menon's book in the YouTube description. So we would recommend you to get those books and read. Thank and you for saying what I should any, have said. <laughs> if you have any feedbacks for the book, share, share that with us on carvanheritage at gmail.com or we'll, we'll, uh, you can uh, send it directly to Ambassador Menon and you can tweet uh, to Ambassador Menon on Twitter. And uh, these books are available on, you know, in bookstores across the nation. So you do not have anything to worry about. If you can't get it online, go to a bookstore, get five more books and get this book along with that. Uh, so that, uh, you know, you'll, you'll get to learn about this. And if you're new to Carvan, a subtle plugin, do follow and do subscribe to Carvan uh, YouTube channel for such engaging conversations. Uh, there's a question, a uh, very interesting question. Um, <laughs> why does India have such a small pool of IFS officers in the services? <laughs> uh, yeah, it's a, it's a very good question, actually, because, you know, I mean, I've argued for a long time we need more diplomats, that, that diplomacy gets more and more complicated, actually, complex. And, uh, you know, we, in 2008, actually, cabinet approved doubling the size of the foreign service in five years, because you can't do it overnight. You can't just, you need to train them, you need to get them to understand what they're doing. Uh, and I think we did that. Since then, I, I believe they have also tried other approaches, apart from doubling the size of the service itself, Many more, uh, well, they get interns, they get uh, people from other departments to work in MEA. Uh, we have people from the armed forces now working throughout the ministry in various jobs. 
Uh, and if you look at the effective diplomatic presence we have abroad, uh, the Foreign Service is a minority even in the embassies abroad. It's, it's, it's only the core in many of, the, especially in the big embassies, you look at London, you look at Washington and so on, the Foreign Service is outnumbered by, by the rest of India. Now that's not a bad thing because you know, uh, if you want to be truly representative, you do need expertise from across the board, across government, but also ultimately, I hope, from across society, whether it's business, whether it's, that hasn't happened yet, whether it's, you know, from academia, from business, that is not yet a feature of our diplomacy, but it is growing. So the problem of the number of foreign service officers, in a sense, we have finessed the problem slightly. I don't think we're enough yet. I don't think our diplomatic footprint is big enough. I don't think we're active enough. Because of shortage of numbers, we concentrate on a very few things which really matter. And you know, the urgent sort of takes over from all the stuff that you would ideally in, in the world be doing. Uh, but uh, it still means, I mean, one advantage, by the way, of, of having a small foreign service is that you've managed to maintain a reputation for quality. I and mean, if you ask most people to rank diplomatic services in terms of effectiveness, who are good diplomats, who, uh, and I think that most of them would rank the IFS pretty high in the sort of international scale. Uh, but uh, I agree with you, we need more. Why are there so few? I don't think there should be so few. I, and I think we, we should try and, and increase the number. You know, the, there is another argument which says that a lot more of diplomacy is done outside, that the state is less. I think actually the state has got more important in diplomacy. There was a period perhaps where, you know, there was where the state's involvement in many of these activities uh, was diminishing. But uh, today, increasingly, the state is involved even in areas that at least initially were not. Look at uh, internet governance, for instance. Today, states are involved in trying to set the rules. They might not succeed, but they're all trying and they have different ideas of what, how to do it. But the, the whole sector started entirely free of state control. In fact, it was all kinds of private, semi-private, non-governmental business organizations who actually set the rules, standards, et cetera, to start with. So actually for me, the state's function has actually increased over time and therefore you need more diplomats. Definitely. Um, Arpesh asks that as India-US defense cooperation and Indian home ground defense complex increase, how it will affect India-Russia relationships? I think it worries the Russians when they see our increasing closeness with the Americans. Secondly, the Russians, you know, they, they feel so pressured by the US and the West that they have increasingly been pushed into working with China, getting closer and closer to China. But left to themselves, I don't think they'd be very happy in that position. In fact, the last thing they want to be is to be regarded as subordinate allies of China of some other power. I mean, the Russian quest is to be a global superpower again. I mean, that's, and Putin has restored their great power status as shown by intervening in Syria across the world that he's a factor to be reckoned with. Uh, and I think the Russians also value the relationship with India and just as we do, I mean, for us also, it's still a very, very important relationship. You look at our major weapons platforms, they're still Russian. It's, they haven't been, you know, we've always had one or two things from other places, but I mean, we bought the Mystères from France. We used to buy Alouette helicopters, all this, you know, in the 50s, 60s as well, we went elsewhere. But uh, basically, we do need to work on that relationship with Russia because, and of what you mentioned in, in an early question, if we are a continental power, as much as we are a maritime power, 
our maritime needs might be met by a free and open Indo-Pacific, by the Quad, by working with the US and so on. But our continental needs on the Asian continent, Eurasia, those require us to work with friends like Russia, Iran, other continental powers, other people who are there, who can affect outcomes and build outcomes that work for India. And we need to work with them. So for me, this is actually a strategic imperative. So it's more than just, you know, uh, how will they react to what happens with the US? We need to work on the relationship with Russia simultaneously. And I think the Russians also understand that, you know, yes, they might be unhappy with some of the things we do with the US. They certainly don't want the competition. They don't want somebody else selling weapons where in the past they had a market which worked for them. Uh, but uh, I think, you know, both sides recognize that there's more to this relationship and we will keep the defense relationship going as well. You've seen on the S-400 missiles, for instance, we've made it quite clear that we will continue despite threats of sanctions and US pressure and so on. Thank you so much, Ambassador Menon, for answering the questions from our audience. And I think we had a great audience this time with so many amazing questions for you. And um, it was truly an honor hosting you, uh, interacting with you for the first time, hosting you for the second time on Caravan. The earlier was the first version of our lecture series called Learn at Home series that we started last year. Thank you so much for your continuous support to the initiative. And we look forward to hosting you again very soon. Thank you, Ishan. Thank you. I really enjoyed that. And I really enjoyed the question and answer. Maybe next time we'll do without the lecture. <laughs> Definitely so. <laughs> questions. Thank you. Thanks Thank you so much, everybody, for joining in. Um, we'll be back with another session. Uh, the next session is on 12th of November by Ari Gauthier. He'll be joining us uh, to speak about Portuguese and French India, uh, memory in the sea of amnesia, which I think is an interesting topic. So do join us for that. And if you like the session, you have to like the video. You have to share it with your friends, families on social media and uh, the WhatsApp University. <laughs> and uh, Spread the word. Help us reach out to a larger audience. And 